I know, right? He's trying to take my job. <laughs> so welcome to anybody who's not familiar with our Every Friday class. Right now, um, a group of students, as you see, pretty much are predominantly in the front. We get together every Friday, and we kind of listen to another speaker, and they explore a different venture into artificial intelligence, and they're able to give us a different aspect and, and help us learn just a little bit more about what AI is. Anyone familiar with the company Moxie? We were lucky enough to have Mr. John Rich come and talk to us a couple weeks ago about so. And now today we have Mr. Pedro Adivalo. See, I had to look back. We had to talk about that. It's tough, man. Um, and today he will be explaining exactly what uh, Moxie is, maybe just a step further. He is a senior data engineer, and uh, Moxie as a company is listed as a marketing solutions agency. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the project, you know, AI Against Humanity, but this is not necessarily going to be about a project. It's more about a journey, specifically my journey, because, you know, at one point I was also a student like you guys, and I actually graduated uh, from the digital media program at Georgia Tech. So the digital media program is mostly like a program where you kind of go and find yourself, right? So it's about different aspects of media, like civic media, you have entertainment media, you have you know, different sorts of media. So I was able to explore like uh, stuff from like VR, mixed reality, to haptics, to physical computing. So I did everything and somehow I ended up being a data engineer. <laughs> so, and actually my background was in linguistics and foreign language teaching. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through, through a little bit of a journey and also some of the projects that we do at Moxie, specifically related to AI, machine learning, just general, uh, the machine, uh, the intelligence practice. So let's start with data engineer. So, first of all, you know, uh, I am a data engineer. So, if you ask what data engineering is, it's actually a lot of things. Uh, so, it's not it's about the architecture, uh, but it's also about uh, how you download data, process the data, and present it to analysts so that they can actually get insights from it. So, in my case, I work with the Verizon client mostly on the CRM side of the business. So, uh, raise your hand if you have Verizon here. Okay, wait, really? That's only a few people. Okay, <laughs> anyhow, so, so what we do is that, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, access to a certain data, and we try to look at different behaviors uh, and, you know, analyzing, like, how the products move and how a lot of different aspects of the company move. So I'm like the person that's in between the data and the final analyst, whether that is a senior analyst, lead analyst, or, you know, any sort of analyst. Uh, one of the important things that I do is that I get this data and I organize it in such a way that it's very easy to process. This data helps to take, uh, to, helps Verizon in order to take the, uh, to make decisions. So whether to change a web page, for example, whether to change their emails, uh, if these emails are bugging you too much, you know. Uh, so we actually look at a lot of different aspects within the data in order to kind of like fine tune. Just letting you know, data privacy wise, you guys are fine. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of concern of like, oh, I wonder who looks at my information. It's like, it's people like me most of the time, and I never look at, uh, like, at people like you, for example, specifically. We never look at one person. It's mostly about like groups as a whole and trends as a whole. So uh, at, at least on our end, you're good. I don't know about Google. Uh, so another part is, you know, it's uh, data and, and specifically data engineering is very interesting because you're looking at the past because every data that you capture is always in the past, right? But you're looking at the past in order to kind of predict the future, right? So a lot of this is going back and seeing what happened in the past, trying to organize, uh, to, to organize this to understand, you know, what was happening, for example, with phone sales or, or with behavior related to email opens and clicks. Uh, but we also deal a lot with the fact that we try to get this data and, uh, and like organize it in ways so that we can predict the future and see uh, what's the likelihood of certain events happening in the future. Um, I actually found myself in this job like in a very interesting way. So I started as a future experiences, experiences intern. So it's like a trade of all, uh, jack of all trades, there you go, jack of all trades in the future experiences lab uh, that John directs. And uh, I did everything from like, you know, VR, like physical installations and all these things. And at some point I really got interested in data and how data and specifically how data and AI affect uh, like physical installations, for example. So the fact that you're uh, that you're in a class, uh, you know, a lot of people think that media tends to be a little bit more like archaic, and they do not realize how fast uh, it has evolved. So, for example, in the digital media program, we had uh, projects where you would dance, and uh, there was there was this image 
of uh, like a dancing like humanoid, and it started dancing and creating its own move based upon like the moves that you uh, that, that you did in front of the screen. So I found myself in that and fascinated by that, and you know I got offered a job after I graduated, and it's been like two and something years, uh, and it's been it's been a constant learning process, and I'm going to talk about this learning process a little bit uh, further on. So. <clears throat> As part of this learning process, definitely it's the part that, you know, Moxie is a company that has like future, uh, where we feature enable uh, brands. So uh, what happens is that a lot of the time, uh, you know, people get new technologies and they're like, oh, blockchain, AI, let's use that, right? Without really understanding what's happening. Uh, and what we do at Moxie is that we take this, uh, we take all this new technology and start tinkering with it. Right, so uh, our our motto uh, in the uh, in the future enabling process is first that you need to define a problem before you try to solve the problem. Because if you go ahead and say like VR is going to be a lot better at X Y Z, and you don't really test it, and you don't really know what AR is, uh, I'm sorry, VR is about, uh, you're really just creating a fancy medium and like creating something without the, the proper affordances. So uh, that and this happens. This happens a lot with a lot of technology, where you know you try to like kind of like solve problems with technology, and it turns out that in the end, the problem is not uh, the problem was not necessarily being solved with technology, but you just needed to accommodate the you know the older ways, right? But in the process, you also find out that there are ways to find uh, what this technology does, and especially how it's going to affect the future, but specifically how it's going to affect the future of, uh, of our clients, right? Because right now, like autonomous vehicle or like autonomous vehicles or genetically engineered food uh, has nothing to do with like, uh, you know, certain companies, but it doesn't mean that in the future it won't. Uh, it won't. So for example, you know, what John was talking about uh, during the last session, that you have this exponential change and you never know when uh, something in, in, in a new technology is going to really affect a brand, right? Um, so in the future enabling, you know, we, we bring the uh, this different disciplines uh, inside of Moxie. So for example, I'm part of data sciences, uh, data sciences, but we also have people from solutions. We have people from uh, progr uh, on the programming end and creative too. So we come together and kind of like start thinking, what does a solution and, and what does this problem look like and what can we do in order to solve them? And sometimes the answer is not necessarily a, you know, a fancy AI product blockchain. You know, stuff like that. So uh, I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, it's the AI Against Humanity project. So this is our uh, chat initiative. So this is technically a, a very fancy chatbot. And what's very cool about this project is that it was not trying to solve a specific business case. It was not saying like, we're gonna turn Verizon's chatbot into a super intelligent chatbot. This was more about understanding how human speech works and specifically how it works outside. So a lot of the times, what you uh, what you end up having is you know a bunch of like a group of engineers and they think about the data, they gather this data in a very specific way, and uh, you know they just feed it into a model, and that's what you get, right? But it turns out that data is never wrong. Like the, every every data point that you collect at any point is actually data that you have to collect with a purpose. So data does not exist in the wild. There's always there's always a purpose uh, that you have in order to collect data, whether that is outside temperature human speech, feedback from uh, different transactions and whatnot. So in this case, what we did is that we have this project and we want to see how people interact with the chatbot and also what type of tools we had available in order to actually uh, give, them, uh, give them back something. In this case, uh, a response. We're gonna do a test at the end of this class. Uh, we have the server up and you're gonna try and find out if this is a robot or not. So it's based on the Turing test, actually. Uh, and what you do is that you go in and uh, into, uh, in, into a website and you ask a question, right? So once you ask the question, you, you enter into a, you go into a lobby and uh, a machine or, or a person will ask a question and you're gonna have an answer. After two rounds, you're gonna decide whether the person that was answering and asking the question was a human or a robot. And we were able to get like 40% of the time people believed that the robot was actually a person. Uh, and I'm going to explain a little bit like some of the models and some of the things that, that, that uh, came uh, into building this. So uh, first of all, you know, it's, it's, it, it was all about like how human speech, uh, how human, human speech works and also how human speech works in the, uh, like in the wild in a sense. So, uh, so one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that we first started doing is like we started doing tests uh, between ourselves. So there, uh, there was no AI involved. 
So we started testing this uh, among ourselves and like uh, answering questions, just creating a data set of just a bunch of questions. We're all out of obscenities, of course, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the process. And this is something that is uh, it's part of human speech and you need to learn you know, how to kind of like avoid uh, making your robot like into a racist and as, as it happened to, I think it was Microsoft, yeah. like Tanya Tan, something like that. And it became like super racist, like in like three seconds. So we needed to create, we needed to create a, a way to avoid this problem because this is a real problem, you know. Like people actually like to uh, get these AIs and like uh, make them into this like very what is the worst of humanity we can offer to uh, to a robot or, or to an AI and, and fit that into it and let's see what happens, you know. So we started doing that, collecting all of the data, trying to. Uh, uh, trying to ban some answers, or not, not some answers, but, but kind of like filter and see what was actually like actual human speech in this case. Now, uh, this is uh, the, and the most important part of this process is that we realized that the data in this case, the data that we were collecting, was part of like human, uh, of like real human speech. It was not collected like in like any sort of environment, but it was collected with a purpose. We asked people like ask questions related to this and that, like very specific topics. And what it, it helped us uh, is that we realized that sometimes, you know, when you build when you build tools like this, uh, you're going to build tools like this with data sets that come from a third party, and this third party has collected this data for a very specific purpose, and this actually uh, creates a model that will give you answers related to that data specifically. But when you start creating uh, a data set that is actually related to your product, to the actual humans that will end up using your data, this is, where, this is where it becomes a lot more interesting and where, where the product actually starts shaping more into something that's uh, for the user by the user as opposed to something that's like a third party that somebody collected. Uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit of a backend. I have a small video here. No. Should start playing. So the first thing that we did is that you know you got the input. Uh, now it's really important to know that you know all of all of the data you, you you have to go through a lot of process because human speech is probably one of the most complicated things that you would always uh, that you would ever work with because uh, it means a lot of things. Uh, like uh, we have we have semantics and syntax involved. And uh, what we did is that you know we cleaned this uh, uh, we cleaned this text into a way that a machine can read it. So it turns out that machines are pretty stupid. Like just in general, machines are very 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 dumb. Uh, what they understand is actually mathematics uh, most of the time. So what you're gonna have is that uh, you have to go through a process called lemmatization. You have to clean the words. You have to get rid of stop words, for example. You have to read. Uh, you have to get rid of a lot of the noise. And then what happens is that this data actually gets vectorized. So are you guys familiarized with vectors and everything? Cool, okay. So think of it as giving like a mathematical uh, footprint uh, to a word. And with this mathematical footprint, uh, what we can do is that we can actually end up creating a mathematical representation of a phrase or a question, right? This then uh, came into, into different sort of like uh, models and types of, wait, let's see, come on. I thought it was going to play on a loop. Okay. So we went uh, to the next phase of the project, which was, what, which was actually understanding what should we use in order to give you an answer. So it turns out the answer is a lot of different. Uh, there are a lot of different ways in order to give you an answer. So now I'm going to stop right here. Let me see if it allows me to stop. And I'll talk about this. Pedro, will you explain what a vector is? So uh, what a vector is is a mathematical representation. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, so we have an array. Right. So, for example, in vector, let, let's talk about the word uh, king. Right. So, in the word king, you're going to have a in, in the vector, you're going to have an array. So, the first part of the array is going to give you the result of how does this word uh, uh, see is in terms of zero to one, how female or how male this word is. So, male would be like ninety. Right. So, you would have a zero point nine. Then, comma, you would have like, is this word royal? Yes or no. So how royal is this word? Uh, so in this case, it would be like a 98, so 0 0.98. And then you would have something like, uh, is this a title? So uh, the other part of the vector would be a title. So it's, it's sort of like a mathematical abstract representation of something. Yes. Uh, so think of it as, as like an array and just a bunch of numbers. But these numbers actually represent something. Uh, okay, let's see. 
So, and I'm going to talk about you know a couple of the models because sometimes human speech can be simple, like hey, can you open the door, or what time is it, or uh, you know what's the temperature outside, uh, or what's your name. So we're going to have um, right here, and I don't think it's going to stop. So I'm just going to try to remember all of these methods. So we have the intent. The intent is actually a rule engine. So what is two plus two? So and the the robot will give you like oh it's four. Then you're going to have something that's more. Uh, more knowledge base. So in the knowledge base, what you're going to be like, uh, what year was the American independence? So when you ask questions like that, you just go into the data set, like kind of like uh, get the answer, and then you have something that's a little bit more, a little bit more complex than that. Should have known this. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. But said machines are gone. Yeah. Machines are gone. <laughs> Okay, and uh, give me one second. So again, we go through the process. There you go. Retrieval. The retrieval is probably one of the most interesting ones, and it's actually the one that gave us uh, gave us the most leverage. So it turns out that when you ask a question and when somebody responds to that question, we log in this into the database. And inside of this database, every time you ask, so for example, if a, if a member of a customer service team and you ask them like, how much are the phones? Or when should I pay my bill? The answer will always be the, uh, like, you, uh, the phones are blah, blah, blah. And, and you start creating a set of rules that we then apply uh, in, the, in the generative model. So the, the robot actually starts learning, or the AI model starts la learning more and more and more about this question and actually starts creating coherent a answers to all of your questions. So you can, right now, there has been like, we've logged like thousands upon thousands of different questions because this robot has been tested in a bunch of conferences that we have. You'll see it in a moment uh, once I'm done. Uh, so also part of the uh, part of the initiative, we had this project, which was the uh, uh, which was the Starbucks project. So Starbucks came to us uh, and they asked us like, Moxie, how can we increase order accuracy? So I don't know if it happens to you a lot, and I hate when this happens when you go to any uh, like restaurant or any you know fast uh, fast food chain. And you order something, and they always give you the opposite of what you want, right? Uh, or sometimes, well, they will give you the opposite. So what we did is, first of all, we created, uh, we started experimenting with VR. And it turns out that the physicality of VR is very, it's, it's very good and very well related to the um, to the training of the barista and, and their like day-to-day -day and, and regular actions. So uh, we used, why is this not playing? There you go. Okay. So we use the uh, we use the uh, the this. And on top of that, we use uh, natural language processing in order to get the uh, to get the order for, uh, from the customer. So this is in this case what we're showing here is a VR experience where you're a barista and they ask you to do something, and the machine and in the in the process it starts telling you like, oh, in order to be like venti cafe latte grande unicorn blah blah blah, uh, <laughs> you need to per you know first do milk, then do sugar, then do you know and, and go through all of these steps because then in the end this is actually a repetitive a repetitive process, but there's a hell of a lot of combinations. Uh, the other part was definitely. Doing the, the the part of the of the speech, so sometimes you know people do not understand you. They're not listening well, or they're doing like thirty uh, like thirty tests at the same time. So what we did is that you know we had uh, uh, we we had the natural language processing uh, part of it where it would actually capture your order, kind of like totally like oh is this what you order? Is this what you order? And finally, what we had, and we're getting into uh, one of my favorite topics. Uh, we had a computer vision piece. So in the computer vision piece, uh, we did uh, we carried it away. So that if you stepped into a Starbucks uh, store, this uh, Starbucks is not using this, this does this, they this, this, uh, model, uh, and you would opt in, uh, we would use Chinese level face recognition system. <laughs> and I'm just kidding, no. So a, a face recognition system that uh, would allow you to tell like, oh, Pedro's here, and Pedro's favorite drink is the Tiavana Ilberry white tea, uh, tea grape, which is totally inaccurate. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I like frappuccinos a lot, uh, but anyhow, so, it would it would attack you, and before you came into into like the counter, it would it would let you it would let them know that you're there and that you uh, that you usually order this drink, so they will have it ready for you. So like, hey, you know, hey Pedro, we noticed that you've been here, and this is you know this is your favorite drink. So it was more like thinking about like an opt-in program. We actually won that account. Uh, so very interesting uh, part about uh, computer vision is that there is a lot of, uh, out there, so, which brings me to my next project. 
which is a, a phone detection system. So with this phone detection system, I don't know if you know, but when you're trading a phone, unless you're in a store, you have to send your phone uh, through mail. And if it doesn't give you the value that you want, sometimes they don't give it back. Uh, they, uh, they just give the phone and you know, they, they just discard, discard it or, or recycle it. So this was a big problem and we came up with a solution that involved using uh, computer vision in order to solve this problem. So, uh, and the problem was not necessarily that a person couldn't look at the phone and it's like, it's broken or not. It was more about the transparency of what happened at home before you actually sent it. So if you know it was, it was worth it uh, to send it or not. So I'm gonna show you a small video. This is like super, super early stage. Uh, so we had a phone and uh, you put it in front of the camera. And what it did is that it tried uh, to detect if the phone is broken or not, but it also used text recognition in order to see what is the model, the naked model of the phone. So I don't know if you've seen, but your, your iPhones are marked with like a little model when you go into settings. That says like, uh, this is an a MK88 blah, 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 okay? So, and, the interesting part about this is that, uh, this is again a lesson, is that AI doesn't solve everything. So uh, this is actually very interesting because I tried to fit this into uh, creating a convolutional neural network, which is a neural network specifically for computer vision, uh, to make it detect broken phones. So, and this brought me to something that I call the Anna Karadina principle, which is uh, for broken phones, which is every mint phone looks alike but every broken phone breaks in a different pattern. So, and this is very difficult to detect when it comes to, uh, when it comes uh, for you to, uh, to create a model. So think of uh, when you create models uh, uh, in computer vision, what it does is that it creates an abstraction, right? So for example, you can train a model to say like, this is a chair and this is a black chair. But what happens when you start giving like a thousand examples? It will say like, oh, a chair has like, you know, four legs and whatnot. But then you find that there are chairs that are not necessarily made like this. They, have, they only have like little uh, thing in the back and they do not have like the four legs, instead they have one leg and they change a lot. So it turns out uh, what models and what AI does, and specifically computer vision does really well, is that it creates an abstraction, a mathematical abstraction that allows to apply this. And this is exactly uh, very close of how your brain works. So when you see a person, I don't know if you guys see faces in like, Object sometimes where you need like the two little eyes and a smile, that is that is technically your brain saying like, oh, this is close to a smile, uh, you know, or, or to a human face, right? So this is uh, this is what it does. So in, in order to solve this problem, I actually had to go and create a completely different way, so, uh, or a completely different solution. So as part of the experiment, what I did is that first, you know, you have to isolate the images, uh, and, it, and then like I tried, I literally threw every single neural network and most advanced stuff, and it was able to recognize some broken phones, but not a lot of them, but not all of them. So in the end, I ended up, you know, I ended up finding that when you have breakage like this, this actually creates a pattern where when you apply a couple of different techniques, uh, like watershedding and uh, black hat, top hat, there, there's a couple of like computer vision techniques that actually uh, create a, a very, uh, like very fine lines and then I use something that they use in order to counter blood cells. And when you did that, it's called watershedding, and the image actually starts turning into a lot of different color colors. So a mint phone is actually unicolor, and phones that are broken are actually different colors, and you can count this off sections in order to, uh, to get this. And this was a solution that was created like back in the 70s with mathematics. It was nothing that was you know too fancy, something that, like models that were created back in 2017 uh, were failing, but in this case, you know, it actually worked. Which brings me to ongoing learning. So I uh, so told you this is you know, part of the journey. So definitely the one thing that I learned is that in, in careers like this uh, and just generally in life, it's not really about the skills that you're going to have, uh, what you're gonna have to offer uh, later on in life. It's mostly about your ability to learn. If you're good at learning, you're gonna be prepared to whatever, uh, whatever the future throws at you. Because right now we're talking about blockchain and right now we're talking about you know, certain NLP algorithms but it turns out that in the future, this is this is definitely going to uh, this is definitely going to change. Like you know, what's uh, what's our like what currently is our Netflix? Uh, it can be like uh, tomorrow's blockbuster, right? So it's going to be uh, it's it's your ability to learn. And this is something that I encourage, and it has helped me a lot. That when I got into into data engineering, I, I literally knew like UX design and you know. Uh, basic JavaScript and Python, but uh, once you start getting into this and start looking a little bit more 
into what you can learn and, and where to find the resources and how to become a better learner, this is actually worth much more than you knowing how to do gradient descent in, in a Python script. You know, so uh, a lot of the resources, and then this is something that I do recommend, is like you start learning coding. I don't know if you guys do code a lot. No? Okay, raise your hand if you know at least one programming language. Okay, so a few of you, that's good. Uh, so, but ideally you would learn, you know, different programming languages, specifically the ones that fit their own purposes. So for example, if you work with data, I heavily recommend Python and SQL. Those were like the two ones that I used uh, the most. And I think, you know, a lot of the data science uh, data science practice right now is, uh, is built in Python and R, uh, mostly. So, you know, uh, Moxie helped a lot um, as, as part of the company. It was, it was actually great because they allowed me to, to first, you know, work in this endeavor, even though this is not my main job by far. And uh, second of all, you know, they, 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 they had a really, really good, like, uh, learning budget, so I was able to purchase uh, really, really good co uh, courses. And you know, make sure that whenever you're in a job, that that, that your job facil facilitates you learning. Because whatever skills you have right now, in the next 10 years, they're probably not gonna be that great. And uh, you're gonna have to always be updating. You always have to do ongoing learning. You always have to, you know, think of yourselves as like doctors, in a sense. You know, a doctor, they, when they go through medicine school and they learn something, it's never like what they have to end up learning. They always have to go to congresses and they always have to go to conferences in order to keep updating and new, you know, whistles and stuff. So, so friends right here, you know, the cure for boredom is curiosity. <laughs> curiosity is actually, you know, uh, one of the best tools that you can have. Never think that because something looks too complicated, you cannot do it. And, and there's no cure for curiosity. Let's talk. So do you guys have any questions or anything? So it's it's not necessarily preferred, uh, but right now it's it's very good because it's very highly adopted. So you have a lot of uh, a lot of libraries. So for example, ASP Learn is probably one of the best libraries that you can have in, in machine learning, and because there's a lot of documentation. No matter how obscure your question is, there's always going to be some random person on YouTube that's going to show you the way. So I think it's it's mostly because of the accessibility and also because a lot of it, like the libraries, help you a lot. Like you don't need to not you do not need to know. Like everything in calculus in order to do calculus in it. Yep. Going back to your uh, Starbucks um, yes. example, when you created that and multiple iterations in which you, you it starts to adapt, um, is this used for like a training to the barista, or is it actually implemented on site with the barista as far as um, features? So actually, it's very interesting. So our first run at it was doing VR, but the real purpose of it was actually doing in MR, so mixed reality. So ideally, what we wanted to do was actually have actual real coffee. The thing is that it was right at the moment where they were about to release the, what was the class? Magic Leap. The Magic Leap. And we were, yeah, it, it was actually ported after into the Magic Leap. But at the moment, we only had like the Oculus. So ideally, we, you would you would have a superposition of, of the digital components into into real life, and you would actually pour the real coffee, go through the process of creating your own drinks. Yeah. So it was it was you know it, it started like that, and 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 sometimes when you do not have like the, the the tools at the moment, you think like what's the second best before I adapt it. So you can actually start defining more like getting better questions, you know, as opposed to having to, oh, I'm gonna wait, you know, three months for the go for the magic leap to finally go out. Yep. Um, I was wondering what program produced the uh, VR and MR uh, Unity. Unity. And it was not me. <laughs> so so I didn't the uh, I didn't do the, the the VR piece, even though I know how to code, uh, I know how to do my VR projects, I did mostly the, the computer vision and also some of the consulting part of it. So this was all part of the future enabling uh, process that we have at the company. So there's around like seven to eight people right now uh, working uh, like from different disciplines. So every now, you know, uh, uh, we, all, we all come together and, and, build, uh, and build a lot of this. The 3D modeling is actually Unity Store. Yeah, the Unity Store has great assets. So when I was in grad school, 
like it was great because you just went in and looked like free peacocks because I was doing a dwarf about like uh, VR mining, uh, and it was it was great. Like you can find you can find free resources almost anywhere online. Yes. Uh, so I have um, one uh, two questions. Uh, I was trying to follow along the loop that wasn't looping, um, and because um, I saw you had input normalizer evaluator humanizer output. Yes. But under evaluator, you had intent and retrieval. What were the other two under there? Uh, so we're, uh, I'm about to see. I don't okay. remember them off the top of my head. I completely forgot that this last part, which is it turns out that if you talk like a robot, people will think that you're a robot. So the humanizer part is that as part of human speech, you make typos, uh, and you also use like different words uh, in order to describe something. So there was there was land uh, created into into the robot. Every now and then, you'll see like problems, like punctuations. Okay, intent retrieval, generative. I completely forgot. So generative, uh, the generative model was part of a something that's called a generative adversarial network. So G A N. So this was a network that, I don't know if you've seen, but some people have created like movie scripts with them. You just throw a bunch of text to it, then it spews out text. That was part of it. I didn't, I didn't uh, program that, uh, that piece, but what I know is that the results of it were sometimes good, sometimes bad. I, like, I, I remember one time I asked the robot, like, hey, tell me a joke. And it was like, your mom. <laughs> I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> like very bad at the same time. You know, like expecting like knock knock, who's there? Stuff like that. You know. <laughs> On the other hand, it was a sick burn. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was. It, it was hilarious. And, and I actually keep a. I actually keep like a small, a, a small screenshot of that. I love it. I, I love it to this day. I don't think it was a failure for me. It was a hundred percent a success. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, 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 so that was a generative what? That so it's a generative adversarial, adversarial network. Why, why is it called adversarial? I have no clue. <laughs> I mean, that, that, yes, that, I, that, that was, so this, this is actually interesting because the, the most complicated part was actually built by the director of data sciences at Moxie. So he's like, wait, am I allowed when it comes to this? But what I know is that adversarial networks are very different from other networks because they have a memory. Mm -hmm. So they remember sometimes if you're trying to, uh, to like say, build a model, they remember that if it is rainy, uh, you know, you're gonna get burgers, for example, and it, rem and it remembers every time you do a different iteration. So there's a couple of like really good videos if you find, if you if you Google generative adversarial network, okay. where, they, where they explain why those networks are very specifically tuned for human speech. In the same way that convolutional neural networks are very tuned for uh, computer vision. Okay. Yeah, just because in generative networks, um, in this case, it's used because if you're creating two AIs that are challenging each other okay. to validate that answer looks legit. So they're training each other. Right, they're, they're by creating an adversarial. You guys can all try it right now. If you go to the website, this person is not real. Yeah. In the moment you get a return, it will generate a person. New person. And that's all being done by two adversarial networks. And they legit look real. Like they could be a Tinder profile and whatnot, but they're not real. So, yeah. so my, my second question was, um, and I don't know if this exists, but it, it should, and it probably does, but if, um, I, uh, if a student is not a programmer, but wants to make a chatbot that is funny, okay, and, and maybe just, you know, maybe just has one of 10 or 20 responses, is there a... Uh, software that enables that? I think uh, as part of our experimentation, we use the IBM Cloud, okay. and they have they have a speech API that it's free to use, and it's actually, the model is actually very good because you train it to recognize certain intent, but the intent is not, you're not gonna have to hard code, code every single question mm -hmm. of the intent. It's gonna, it's gonna kind of like fine tune so that if you ask like, can I have a beer, is the same thing like, a beer please, gotcha. you know? But you only have to do, can I have a beer? Gotcha. Yeah. So that's like through Watson. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be Watson. Okay. And if you're you know if you're not a programmer, Code Academy, it's like amazing. Offers amazing resources, and it's very very simple. They take you from the first hello world, which everybody has to do at one point, mm -hmm. up to the point where you know you're working with like complex data structures. Uh, uh, Code Academy, like Code Academy. Taking it back to whenever you were in Georgia Tech, and yeah. you were kind of in a similar situation as a lot of us are. How did you learn about Moxie, or what was your exposure in the internship world of what you were studying? 
Yeah, so uh, it was actually interesting being a, 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 like being a, a tech like the university. You get a lot of contacts because people go out to those companies. And same thing for uh, I would say like for GSU. Once you, once people start going out, like you might be like a first year student, right? And the second year students actually graduate and they get jobs. So always keep track of those contacts. Like LinkedIn is probably one of the best tools that you can have. Uh, you know, you never know when somebody's going to be like a, a first connection to a recruiter or somebody who's actually driving the interview process. So, so it was, it was, it was like that. Somebody who worked uh, at Moxie, and then they came back, and it's like, oh, look, Moxie, uh, and then you know, I was like, hey, I want to, I want to, you know, work, uh, like, uh, do my internship at Moxie, and that's how I ended up there. Um, now, did you go through that person, or did you? I, I went through that person first, but then I had to go through a bunch of interviews, and I was actually ended up competing with a person of my master's. Yes, uh, for that same internship. It was pretty nerve wracking because she was really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, in, in terms of in terms of you know, career advice is definitely LinkedIn. Just LinkedIn the hell out of everybody. Like your professors, because your professors do have a lot of connections. Like uh, you never know uh, what's going to take you to the next spot. That's what it's, uh, what's helped uh, helped me. Like I, you can have the best resume in the world, but if you don't if you, if you do not have the contacts, it's actually a bit more difficult uh, in order to get you know a job or an internship. And by the way, Moxie uh, has internships every summer, and part of the internship is the amazing Future Experiences Internship that allows you to build VR, AI, and work with a bunch of different product uh, of, of different projects of a lot of different nature uh, during the summers. They also pay really well. <laughs> it was it was great having that uh, during the summer, and also you know you get a lot of contacts and, and ability to go to different events inside of the of the company into the marketing world. Yep. Other questions? So, are, are we going to play the game? Let's but, play but, a but, game. But wait, I, I have a question before you do yes. that. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, I really like the fact that you, you know, talked about learning to learn. So, we're like treating our own selves as like supervised, you know, learning, <laughs> <laughs> supervised yeah. training, or like like our own AI. Um, but, uh, and, you know, curiosity fuels that. Um, and then you talked about going to um, conferences. What, uh, this is a question for both you and John, what are some of the most, and then you talked about Code Academy. Do you find any one of those things, which is uh, conference versus um, online learning, what do you find people are gravitating towards to uh, continue their education while while working or even while in school. So conferences are really good just for just general, you know, uh, being how do I call it? Anyway, you call it, like being very excited about stuff. Yeah. Like you don't know what's out. Like Inspired, really, kind of. yeah, 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 more more of inspiration because once you see like a flying car and stuff like that, you're like, wow, I want to do that. And mm -hmm. then you investigate, you know, you look a little bit more. And and the only learning part is it's it's very important because you you're are not always going to have the time. Like once I'm at work, I literally work like uh, 40 plus hours a week. And you know, you have to find, to ch you have to find the time to, uh, to study and you know, keep on going, even, even like during work hours, of course. Uh, but, but the only learning part in like self-discipline also works. And let me tell you this, I was a terrible college student. Like terrible, terrible college student. Uh, but once I found my passion and what I really liked, it was a completely different story from there, uh, from there on. It was it was so much easier to just Google stuff and uh, to just learn it by, uh, to learn by myself. And the good thing is, like, if you don't know something, sure to God, it always works to uh, go and ask somebody, like somebody that you know that knows. Like, never be afraid. Like, you only have one life. That's how I ended up at Tech too. That I went to a conference in New York because I really wanted to do video games for learning. And I ended up in this conference in New York called uh, Games for Change. And I talked to a couple of tech professors. You know, sometimes you're like, what if, you know, he hates me and he sees me as this little nerd that comes to talk to him. Um, and in the end, I was like, ah, what the hell? I'm going to die someday. Nobody's going to remember if I say something stupid, you know? Like, nobody, nobody's really going to remember if I, if I said something stupid and, like, uh, and like uh, not something stupid, but, you know, like, uh, it, there, is, there is really no problem. Like, uh, you just, just need to go and remember that, you know, your time is staying you limited, so you need to make the most out of your time. Um, okay. Cool. So let's play a little game. Yeah. And with no shame, though, okay? With no shame, you're going to have to say if you discovered a robot or not. So let's take your cell phones out and let's go to that URL right there, so democracyai.com. 
and just follow the prompt. You, you don't need to put the email, just uh, up, opt in or opt out of the email, or just put like a, like, you know, whatever excerpt from the email. We will never email you anything, and this is probably doesn't even end up in a database. Like the moxiei.com Some of the interesting aspects too is that uh, the robot, you might think that because you have a question, it would, would retrieve in the database and answer you immediately. It doesn't. Sometimes it answers like in human time, like it takes some time, sometimes it takes a little bit less. The time, the time is random. It, and also depends on the length of the question. How does that ensure accuracy? If it's random and just saying something back to what you just asked? No, so it always knows the question right away. Okay. But the time where it sends it to you, it's random. So you don't know, it's like, oh, because it's a robot, like, it'll... Yeah. Yeah, so it has a lot of, like, human components that go into it. Is there, I mean, is your goal here to hopefully get people to uh, either completely notice that it's a robot or to just not notice it? So there were two goals with this prototype. Uh, the first goal was we want to show clients that quote unquote chatbots were ready to make a generational leap forward, and they'd have a lot more capability than current chatbots that are very, very narrow and brittle. This system could learn over time what are people concerned about. It could learn if we, if Delft decided to use this, it could actually be trained on the language, the way that Delta would speak as a brand. Um, also, we haven't added this, but we're going to do emotional detection too, and then it could respond based upon the emotional state of the person having the conversation. So, part one of this was to say, hey, get ready for the next generation chatbots, and hopefully sell some projects um, <laughs> like that. And then the second thing was, there's a big issue now with bias in the AI systems. I'm sure you guys have heard of different cases, everything from Google discounting women's resumes, uh, maybe males that for submitting job applications, giving them higher level, and they had to shut down that system. Or even in our legal system right now, who gets bail and who stays in jail is often run through AI systems, which can be biased. Um, and so what we want to show here was instead of building a fairly rigid system, have thousands of people train it so they actually, it actually learns the diversity of the needs of the people it's supposed to serve. Awesome. So that was the second thing. Yeah, you know, models and <laughs> AI. <laughs> AI in general is as good as the data that you put into it. Uh, you know, there's a saying, garbage in, garbage out. So your data is probably one of the most, uh, the things that you have to fine tune the most before you, know, you put it into, into a model. So, okay, who found the robot and who didn't? I found the robot. You found the ro okay, who did not find the robot? Okay, good. So would it make you uncomfortable to think that, you know, some of the people that you're talking about are not actually real and they're a robot and then you didn't find it? So this is, this is also to think, you know, there, there's a lot of things about human speech and, and what we think of as human and what, and what qualities we can actually start automating into, you know, AI models, for example. Uh, so you can actually respond in a way that a person would respond. 
to... So are we training the model right yes. now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, when we first launched this two years ago, the, we did it at an open house, and so hundreds of people played it. About a third of the people um, got it wrong. They Only a third of the people thought the AI was a human. I don't know what just happened now. The last time we ran it at a conference, 54% of the people thought the AI was a human. So over half. So the system, to your point, Elizabeth, is because we all try to trick it, try to figure out questions to trick it, but then it learns what are tricky human questions. Uh -huh. And then more importantly, it sees how humans answer tricky human questions. Uh -huh. yeah. And that's why now it's probably at 50% or above. Yeah. yeah, so every time we do that, it's like the meme, congratulations, you played yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions or anything, you know, if you ever have questions about just AI in general, uh, data engineering in general. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty reachable. Uh, you know, if, if you're curious about like uh, learning resources or you know how to answer the complex questions of uh, not that part, but like uh, of, or how to you know how to learn new uh, new things, I'm more than open to you know answer those questions. Well, I, I do have a question along those lines. What is now one of the hardest things? Just like uh, Joel asked. Um, you know, like Python, even knowing what to learn, like, you know, sh okay, you said learn a programming language, well, what if you go and learn Pascal? I mean, that's like silly, so, so you, it's so hard to know, like, curating, curating yeah. the learning experiences is one of the hardest things. I mean, there's conferences, and there's conferences. Yeah. There's things to learn online, and there's good, you know, there's ways to learn it more efficiently, better, whatever. And I was curious to know um, how you vet your learning experience. So ideally, you know, you would talk to people that are in the industry and the industries that are relevant. So the same thing for like any sort of like software that, that you're using, because sometimes people end up in legacy systems yeah. because uh, infrastructure is so expensive to change that it's actually easier to just hire people that knew like archaic uh, uh, programming language. So try to, you know, talk, uh, talk to people, especially people that are, uh, that are in the industry, you know, doing jobs that you might like. And don't be afraid to literally reach to random people every now and then, you know? Uh, and uh, aside from that, you know, your professors uh, should have a good idea because they do know, like, in terms of the industry of what is, what is currently happening in, in different areas. Like my boss, he's part of the Georgia, the UGA analytics uh, program board. Mm -hmm. And, like, everything that we do is literally, a lot of things that we do, it's, it's stuff that the students are going to be seeing in their curriculum in the next semester. Because they get informed, they get feedback from you know, um, from the actual industry leaders. It's something that I thought was uh, pretty interesting, which a few people got to take part of um, today. But there's a group. Uh, oh, you probably just pulled your. Yes, uh, but uh, there's a group that that has a um, an AI consultancy here, and they have something called study halls, and you just as just once. Uh, a month, you can just come to their labs and just ask any question about a project that you're working on. So I like that idea of sort of studying alongside. Yeah. It's a really cool idea. Um, yeah, and AI, it, it, here's the thing. A lot of things that when they call AI, AI is an umbrella term. It's not an actual thing. It's not an actual technology. AI is AI is a set of technologies, like for example, machine learning is, it, it would be considered AI, like natural language processing would be considered AI. So, you know, you're not learning AI, you're learning a specific subset. And also, if you're, if you're ever interested in going to an AI career, it's always important to know what area of AI. That's like, I want to be a doctor. Like, yeah, you know, what type of specialization are you choosing? Are you a cardiologist? Are you a neurologist? Uh, and the same thing, like, are you going to be somebody that does computer vision, somebody that does NLP, somebody that, that, that does predictive model? So, yeah, you, you kind of like, and you can experiment, uh, you know, a little bit with every single type of model that exists, or like at least trends of, of the AI realm. Are there any upcoming conferences and biases that you're a part of or hosting? Are we doing future, future X? Well, it's the end of the year, so. Yeah, so we do an annual emerging technology conference called Future X Live here in Atlanta. Our last one, we usually do it annually. It was in April at George Will Congress Center. Yeah. I think our next one will be either next summer or September timeframe. Right now, we're still working out the details. So there is that. Um, yeah, I'm sure that was a few probably know that. A lot of meetups. I mean, are, A3C is going on right yeah, now. And they all got they all got free passes to go to that. Um, 
it's, it's you know it's it's a balancing of time and yeah. you know and finding interest you know uh, but there's uh, to me I I don't think there's a day goes by when there's not a conference that I could be going to somehow or another yeah. you know again you're sort of vetting them um, and depending on your interests and all that sort of thing yeah sometimes it's limited too because there are really great conferences but they're hard like, like CES is something I've gone through the last seven years.